So we can never exceed the intolerance of a jury. So if you think you have the jury at a number two on a scale of 10, you got them up to 10, excuse me, up to two. And they're saying, I'm not sure I believe this guy, this witness. You have to be at a one emotionally and tone wise. You can't even be at a two yet. You always have to lag behind the jury. The jury tells you how tough you can get. Here's the statistics in the United States. 85% of us are visual learners, 85%. If you don't show it to them, 85% of your jury did not get it. They heard it, but it just didn't impact them. And so you have to be visual with things. Is it better to show them a picture or to draw the picture in front of them? By far, drawing the picture in front of them, interactive, so that they become part of it. Here's a new statistic that I just learned the brain has a really hard time differentiating between was it a movie or a drawing or was it real? And the brain ends up storing that in the same place. So when you're drawing, the jury is saying, this is how it happened. This is what happened. I really liked it. Never exceed the tolerance of a witness the way I have thought of it, and I, like I said, I wrote that down because I liked it. The way I've thought of it is that I can't execute the witness. I can't kill the witness until the jury gives me permission. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, if, that, if that's a principle, and I think it's some of what you were saying, well, then how do you know when they do that? Ah, I have to constantly tune in to everything they're doing. And so when you talked about 50%, you could hear and the 85% of us, you know, learn most uh, visually. Uh, my mentor who raised me up in the law told me that the best skill a trial lawyer can have and hopefully develop is the ability to listen. Totally and, agree. Totally and what agree. he told me about that was it's not just listening to what the witness is saying. It's about transporting yourself inside of that witness, inside of their skin, and ask yourself, what is it that they are feeling that is producing these words? Yep. And other questions I ask is, what is it that the witness is not saying? Ah, that'll tell you a lot. But then you also have to say all this at the same time, how did that affect the listener? What are they feeling now that they've heard that? And what would they want to ask? What do they want to know? And then you got to deal with the objection and your co-counsel write your notes and then your own shit you got to get to. And then the, you know, the evidence walk. All these are balls in the air. And look, at the end of the day, if you go and watch a juggler perform on the stage, nobody is going to go watch a juggler who juggles one ball unless it's an elephant or something. <laughs> the ones who are the best at it are the ones who can juggle the most and each one of those items is a different shape size and weight and this is the art of trial advocacy is not just going like this i never even think about responding like hearsay or no it is it isn't or it is or frankly i'm unimpressed by hearsay objections there's one rule and there's 24 exceptions to it how big a rule is that? The judge is going to have discretion. No one gets reversed on hearsay anymore. Right. So, so a number of cases, civil cases, I'll look to see if I can bifurcate the case. And the reason for that is because what it allows me to do is focus more energy and attention on who did what and why. And the reason why I want to often do that is because it then allows me to focus on the villain story before I start getting into what happened or the damages. And I don't want to do that because those are two competing emotions. Uh, there are two competing energies and I don't want to dissipate or dilute either one of them. And I definitely don't want a jury thinking that I'm trying to use sympathy or emotion to get them to overlook a weakness or a weak liability case. And so 
by pushing that to the side and focusing on this, it allows me to keep more credibility and usually get more evidence in than I normally would. And that was the other key in this case, I had to do it. And how does it get, allow you to get more evidence in by bifurcating? So when you're fighting about who did it and they're forcing themselves to say, oh, it wasn't us, then what becomes important is intent because usually there's plenty of holes in you know, the evidence as to how it happened and who did it. So you have to kind of figure that out. And what allows you to figure that out is clearly people's intent. Now, I don't say it that way, though. In the case, what I'll do is I'll talk more about what they were feeling at the time just before whatever the act was that happened starts. Now, the reason I do that is because clearly if I walk into a situation I am of the mind that I'm loving and I'm giving and I want to help somebody, then whatever happens, you can probably forgive to some degree. However, if I walk into that with the attitude of, you know, I'm, I'm judgmental and I'm angry and I'm going to punish this person, anything that happens after that, you're going to say, well, yeah, because look at the way you are, look who you are. So setting it up gives you a lot more information and facts that you normally wouldn't get if you're putting it all together because they start saying, oh, that's character evidence. That's character evidence. You can't go there. Or it's not damages. You can't go there. Doing it this way allows me to do it. And this is very general what I'm giving you. You have to be more specific the way you set each piece up. But that's generally how I do it and why I do it. Thanks. Roger, what's your philosophy on bifurcating a trial? Yeah, it, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if there's a good reason to do it, I don't hesitate to do it. I think it does help the jury focus. And that's really what we want them to do is focus and understand the narrative. So in Joey's case, if he says they're competing energies and competing emotions, great reason to bifurcate. I say it is, ask the question that the jury wants to ask and ask it in the tone they would ask it. Yeah. So, Excellent. you know, so when people say to me, you know, argumentative objection, I'm like, I must have done that just perfectly. You know, uh, I don't, I don't get offended by people saying argumentative. Argumentative means I have a personality. That's what it means. And my opponent doesn't. And they're offended because I have personality <laughs> and they don't. So I don't mind argumentative objections because the only thing that you're gonna change, and Joey did that, was same exact wording, different tone. That's all. It was the same wording. And the judge was equivocal with it. It was like, well, maybe, you know, as stated, and he really meant to say, well, your tone was pretty shitty, so clean up your tone. And you did. But that's the question the jury once, once asked now and I ask it in the tone that they want it asked. Do I get objections? Yeah, particularly in federal court, I get them. I, I get argumentative. In, in Seattle, somebody objected. Objection, argumentative as to tone. And I thought, damn, that is really good. I had never heard that before. And I thought, wow, that's a great objection. I'm gonna have to use that someday. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Look at the penalty. The penalty is you ask the question again. You just clean the tone up. 